Okay, so um, this program is hosted by the Mashpee Public Library and a recording of the presentation will be broadcast by Mashpee TV. Uh, and oh, I forgot to change this. Uh, it's the Mashpee Cultural Council that is um, funding this event. Um, and so I want to thank the Mashpee Cultural Council, the Mash Mashpee TV and Mashpee Public Library for their roles. So we acknowledge that we inhabit uh, land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. So what are beneficials? Well, uh, the, in, the beneficials in the title refers to uh, organisms that help farmers and gardeners grow the food and the crops that we use. Uh, so the three Ps are the beneficial organisms, pollinators, predators, and parasites. They all do good things for gardeners and farmers. Pollinating uh, uh, flowers is the only way to ensure genetic diversity uh, so that uh, each new seed will be a unique individual. Uh, the insects in most cases are the ones that do the pollinating and they unwittingly transfer the pollen from one plant, uh, the flower on one plant to the flower on another. So the, the flower does its best to uh, lure the insects with nectar and, um, and pollen itself is also a, a protein rich source. So, so insects surprisingly do not see what we see because they can see ultraviolet light, which we cannot. So we'll, we might see a plain yellow flower like that, but they'll see a bullseye right in the middle and that's the ultraviolet in the ultraviolet range. Um, uh, they can smell flowers just as we can, uh, but we cannot sense the electrical charge on a flower and yet uh, pollinators actually can sense it and uh, they will preferentially go to a flower that has negative charge rather than one that, uh, which is you know, an experiment where there are dummy flowers that aren't real. Um, but the ones that have a negative charge are the ones that, uh, and, the, and the bees themselves are somewhat positively charged, which means that when they visit the flower, uh, the pollen will stick to them uh, more readily. And remarkably, there are some flowers that actually advertise, we've already been pollinated, don't bother coming here for, for, for the nectar. Uh, and the lupin on the left is, is one such flower. You see the red is, is a sign that those flowers are already pollinated. So uh, that's the, the flower actually turns red when the nectar uh, supply has been taken and has been pollinated. So it, it's, a, it's a sign to the bees come to the uh, uppermost flowers that don't have that red. And on the, the monkey flower on the right, you'll see uh, the first photo where the, the stigma is receptive and the second photo where the stigma is closed and bees recognize that as a sign that there is no more nectar in that flower. The pollinators here, uh, here's a, uh, a beautiful poster, but uh, it's, it's not relevant necessarily to New England because bats are not pollinators here uh, in New England, only in, the, only in the southwestern part of our country do bats pollinate flowers. But we certainly have bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Those are the, I, I'll call them the charismatic pollinators, but we also have moths, wasps, flies, and beetles, which play important roles in pollinating flowers. 80% of all plants need pollinators to set seed. The other 20% are wind pollinated. Uh, one third of our food is pollinated. So, so they're so important. Here's a, a pretty graphic illustration of how important. The, the, the uh, strawberry in the middle is barely a strawberry at all. It did not receive pollen from any other flower. The one on the right managed to receive some pollen on the wind, uh, which is surprising. You know, we, we don't, it doesn't occur to us that there might be some strawberry pollen in the wind. We, we assume that only the pollinators will bring that pollen, but they do get some uh, windborne strawberry pollen too. But uh, there's no question about which is the best strawberry. It's the one that, uh, that uh, pollinators did in fact have access to and pollen was delivered uh, right to that flower. And so, so many more of those seeds were pollinated. Now we're, we're gonna start uh, talking about birds and uh, uh, we can consider them beneficial organisms because they do that, because they are predators, the first of those peas. Uh, they also uh, perform seed dispersal, which is not a, a direct benefit to farmers and gardeners, but it certainly is a benefit to the plants themselves. The only two uh, birds that I'm aware of that do pollination uh, here in New England are the, um, the hummingbird, uh, ruby-throat hummingbird and Baltimore Oriole. Uh, bird populations have declined alarmingly since 1970 by 30%, and two thirds of our birds will be gone at the, by the end of the century if global warming and other factors continue as they presently are. 
Uh, and it's not just the sheer numbers, but also the diversity, the number of different species of all the different land vertebrates uh, and invertebrates as well. But this chart shows the vertebrates and how, how many there endangered species there are in each group. Uh, so when, when we think about bird conservation, first step is let's, uh, first step is do no, do no harm. And window collisions kill up to 1 billion birds in the US every year. Birds see those windows as reflections of, of the outside and, and uh, they think, well, surely I can fly in that direction, but of course they can't. Um, abcbirds.org is a good uh, resource to find different ways to make your bird, your, your windows visible to birds. And every one of these um, uh, URLs uh, that I'm showing you, uh, um, you can, uh, I, I'll, I'll provide them to you at the end of the program if you send an email message to me, info at johnroot.net, and I'll give you that email uh, message at the end of the program. So you won't have to take notes on all the references here. Um, cat, cats kill up to 3.7 billion birds in the US every year. These are both feral and house cats that do this damage, a tremendous loss. Uh, and perhaps it'll motivate folks to keep their cats inside if they realize that there are wild animals that can make a meal of a cat. And there are also other uh, cats and dogs out there that could be a menace to a house cat if it's left out. Uh, habitat loss from in, from agriculture, from residential development, commercial development is a huge impact on all wildlife. There simply are not enough places for wildlife to uh, live, live out their lives. Climate change has had a major impact as well. Uh, the impact on bird populations include habitat loss from a variety of, of causes uh, that are related to climate change, new pests and diseases, disruptions and timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting and hatching are happening and also uh, bird behavior may long, no longer be in sync with their food sources and other habitat needs. So one thing we can do to help birds and wildlife and ourselves is to simply buy less or be aware of uh, which things that we buy uh, have the highest carbon footprint. Unfortunately, there are no such uh, uh, details uh, actually uh, provided to us when we, we are purchasing an item, so we just have to educate ourselves. But um, isn't it remarkable that 42% of our carbon footprint is either a purchase of non-food or food items, the others being passenger transport, uh, building, heating and cooling and lighting, appliances uh, uh, and devices. Well, bird watching connects us to nature and helps us to have a lifestyle that is less materialistically oriented and more uh, oriented to nature. Uh, if visit massbird.org and you'll find a, a, Mass, a Massachusetts bird club near where you live. Um, so birds are so, uh, uh, they, they liberate our spirits. They're, they're, they're so inspiring to watch and, and, to, uh, and to listen to and, and uh, to see how devoted they are to each other and to their offspring. Uh, birds need everything that any organism needs, food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. Uh, Please do not feed birds baked goods or other junk food. Baked goods are junk food because almost always they are heavily processed and they contain things such as preservatives, salt, sugar, and refined flour that are not healthy for birds or humans for that matter. They contain little protein and lack fat. So uh, th these are empty calories for birds. Uh, angel wing deformity, this is uh, the, co the consequence of a bird that's eaten too much of those uh, processed baked goods. Approved foods for songbirds include eggshells, not only for females that will be laying eggs so they can use the calcium, but also uh, I've seen a, a blue jay swallow pebbles. Uh, it's just for roughage in their gizzard so they can digest their food more readily and it'll, it'll break up. Uh, so eggshells can also serve that purpose. Bananas, apples, and raisins are foods that uh, songbirds and other birds can eat. Uh, and some, some more foods include hard cheese. If, if you have some cheese that's gone uh, that's no one wants to eat. <laughs> Peas, corn, oats, squash seeds. I've been feeding squash, squash seeds to both birds and squirrels um, over the winter. Uh, peanuts and other kinds of nuts and peanut butter. Uh, so you can make homemade bird feeders. You can uh, go just to do a search online and you'll find many such uh, designs. If you choose to have a, an open bird feeder like this, you do have a responsibility to clean it fairly often since birds will soil that feeder. Um, here are some examples of ways to keep bird, uh, squirrels away from the uh, feeder. And when you place your feeder, uh, it's, it's good to put it on a metal pole because uh, uh, squirrels and, and predators won't be able to get up there 
as easily. Uh, and if, it's, if the pole is about eight feet long, buried two feet down, then it'll be about the right height, six feet up. Uh, less than three feet from a window or more than 30 feet away. That's the 330 rule. Uh, if it's close to a window or as close as three feet, that's okay as far as the bird's safety, because even if it is startled and, and flies towards the house, it, it won't have built up enough speed uh, so that it, it, it striking the window will be that serious. But if it's say 10 feet away or 15 or something, it will have uh, be, be flying fast enough so that it, would, it might fly into a window. Um, if it's at least 12 feet away from vegetation, that minimizes the risk that, uh, uh, that a predator looking in the, in the uh, shrubbery will be able to lunge and get a bird. Uh, this uh, window feeder might be the best option for, in, for many reasons. Uh, one, that you can see the birds much more readily. Uh, two, uh, you'll be monitoring that uh, window feeder. Every time you pass, you'll, you'll notice whether it needs to be cleaned or not, for example. Uh, also, it's usually going to be out of reach of squirrels and predators. You may uh, feed uh, birds during the summer if you wish. Baltimore Orioles love uh, oranges. Uh, uh, bluebirds will eat uh, uh, mealworms, dead or alive, and uh, that rose-breasted rose -breasted grosbeak and a number of other birds will be happy to eat sunflower seed. If you do decide to feed during the summer, please fill your feeders only halfway and refill them frequently to prevent mold, which will other, may, may otherwise build up at the bottom of that feeder if, uh, in the, the dampness. And um, moving feeders around will, uh, will prevent buildup of waste because seeds will drop to the ground and, and may become moldy. Uh, and that can be uh, hazardous or even fatal to birds to eat moldy seed. Um, Clean your feeders regularly, wash every two weeks, rinse and dry before refilling. You can make suet with uh, suet or shortening and peanut butter. You heat them together and then add the dry ingredients. Uh, you really only need the shortening and, and cornmeal if you want to have a simple suet recipe, but th th these other things are optional. Uh, and uh, please don't uh, leave it out above 50 degrees. It'll turn rancid. So once you have uh, the, that mixture, you just simply freeze it uh, in one of these molds, such as an old tin can or an ice cube tray. And then after a couple of hours, it's frozen and you can put it in your suet feeder. Uh, bird baths uh, can be, uh, you can make one for free if you have the materials handy, or uh, you can buy an in inexpensive one if you like, but it's nice to have that bird bath. And you do have responsibility for cleaning it regularly so it doesn't uh, build up algae and other, um, uh, so, uh, other uh, um, things that you don't want in there. Uh, heated bird baths during the winter uh, keeps that uh, keeps the bird bath from freezing and you and that element is fairly inexpensive to buy. Um, bird boxes, look at look for allbirds.com and you'll see uh, the specifications for these eight and a number of other birds uh, because they actually do need different kinds of uh, different dimensions of bird boxes. Um, the, the box floor, for example, the dimensions of the box floor or the height of that bird box or the entrance height, the entrance diameter and the placement height means how, how far above the ground it is. All those uh, are specified at this uh, website allbirds.com and their basic web, uh, their basic bird box shows uh, three holes at the top of each side panel for um, uh, ventilation, three holes at the, on the bottom for drainage and also notice the hinges on one side so that you can open up that bird box for either cleaning or inspection. Also notice that uh, just like bird feeders going on poles, it's uh, metal poles, it's a good way to keep uh, the, the nest, the bird box safe, putting it on a metal pole uh, and uh, placement uh, in the shade would be a good idea uh, with a clear flight path for the, for the parent birds. And face, if the hole is facing away from the prevailing wind, that then also is uh, desirable. Uh, we, we do not want to be helping out starlings and house sparrows. These are, uh, invasive birds. They came from Europe. They don't belong here. And what they've done is they've, uh, uh, they've displaced a lot. Not only have they displaced uh, native, our native birds, but they sometimes actually uh, kill them and eat them. So uh, these birds are not protected. Uh, you may, uh, by, by the state, and you may uh, harass them uh, or trap them, and uh, you're, free, you're free to do what you will uh, to keep our native birds um, in business. So uh, I'm asking you not to put out uh, bird, house, bird houses that are uh, brightly colored because uh, uh, it calls attention to the predators uh, 
And likewise, those uh, those perches that you sometimes see on bird boxes are totally unnecessary. Birds can fly right to the hole uh, and don't need them. Um, but the perches can be useful to a predator trying to gain entry. Uh, you should not uh, use any other material besides wood in a birdhouse, and you should not let it dangle from a string either. You should have it securely fastened. Um, and to protect uh, birdhouses from squirrels moving in and helping themselves both to the eggs and to the space, uh, well, uh, prevent them from being able to chew that hole and, and, and widen it by putting on one of these pieces of metal hardware with a circle in it. Uh, and here are some devices especially if you're going to fasten the birdhouse to a tree, you, you definitely need to make sure that no predator can gain access. And here, uh, you know, one of these uh, wire cages or uh, these other devices that you see to help uh, protect the birdhouse. At the, at the end of the summer, please clean your birdhouse, nine to one solution of water and bleach. Uh, and think about um, offering a roost box, which can be either homemade or, or purchased. And uh, in the, in the, uh, cold of winter, uh, birds can gather in a roost box and keep each other warm and stay out of the elements. Uh, and during the spring, when they're looking for nesting materials, why not uh, see if, uh, if, they, if you can help them out and put any of these uh, materials in a suet container or just in a mesh bag. And uh, this could be a, a fun activity done with children. Uh, they, would, they would be quite excited to see uh, birds come and help themselves to things that they're offering. Uh, now let's talk about uh, uh, that, that all important uh, question of what's for dinner. Uh, and uh, many birds feed their chicks caterpillars because they're the ideal baby food. They're nice and soft. They're very nutritious. They have everything that those birds need to, to fledge. And birds need a lot of caterpillars. And the mama chickadee here uh, will require 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to fledge her chicks. And how will she get those caterpillars? From native plants. This is under, underlined several times in this book, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy. Uh, and he, uh, he's a scientist who knows a lot about these caterpillars and what their nu nutritional needs are. And he points out that we have so many non-native, uh, you know, in our in a typical uh, uh, suburban landscape, there, it might be 70% non-native and 30% native plantings. And if at all possible, we need to at least reverse that so that it's 70% native. Uh, caterpillars simply cannot eat most non-native foliage because they haven't had time over the course of uh, the thousands of years that it takes to crack the code uh, and, and develop chemicals in their gut that are able to digest the, the substances that leaves create to protect themselves. So those non-native leaves are still uh, well protected from caterpillars, we need more native plants. And nature's best hope is, is also uh, underlining the fact that uh, we really can't expect uh, birds and other animals to rebound the way they need to just on public lands alone. We've taken, we've put so much land uh, in uh, under private uh, ownership that we, that, uh, that, that privately owned land really needs to be a key part of, of uh, of providing habitat for birds. Um, so uh, oak tree is a native tree that is, uh, has all kinds of, it's, it has more, uh, more different species of caterpillar than any other. So it's right at the top of the list of, as a bird friendly tree. Mulberries fruits are irresistible to birds and you'll be delighted to see if you establish one on your property, just how many different species and the sheer number of birds that come and feast on these berries. Don't put the tree overhanging a sidewalk or a driveway because you'll be tracking in the mess. Sassafras, another fruit that's visited by many different kinds of birds and what a beautiful tree it is in all seasons. Uh, elderberry, I call this an uh, Eddie Mediento ornithomental and that's because uh, an ornamental uh, it's almost assumed uh, it, by many people that an ornamental is a, a non-native plant, but our native uh, trees and shrubs are just as beautiful as any that you care to find anywhere else in the world. And uh, because this is uh, for both for insects and birds, I call it an ento uh, ornitho, entom entomology being the study of insects and ornitho uh, being about birds. And it's also edible and medicinal for humans. Uh, those elderberries, I enjoy them in my pancakes. Uh, I put them in muffins. I put them in my hot cereal. 
uh, and it's medicinal because there's nothing like elderberry syrup to uh, ward off the flu. So this is Eddie Medi Ento Ornithomental. Um, wild raisin, what a stunning plant this is. Again, testimony to the fact that our native plants are just as beautiful as any plants elsewhere. Uh, and this is true of all the, all the viburnums have fruit that is appealing to birds. Here's another one, arrowwood, uh, and another one, maple leaf viburnum. It grows in the shade. Uh, and uh, black hom, it's more like a tree. Um, any of the dogwoods uh, have fruit that will be attractive to birds. In fact, birds might strip this tree of uh, of, of the fruit when they're migrating in August and September. Here's another stunning dogwood in all seasons, red osier dogwood. Look at those red branches that persist through the winter uh, and give, give color and, and winter interest. White dogwood uh, is popular with many people as well as with birds. And notice that you can get 10 free, tr free trees if you go to arborday.org. If you make a donation of any amount, they will send uh, 10 different species, which you can see here, one each of these, or you can have 10 white dogwood, 10 American redwood, 10 river birch, or uh, 10 of any of these six conifers uh, for a donation of any amount. Uh, spice bush, the, I was just talking to a friend today who said that he uses spice bush uh, fruits in all of his baking. Um, and, uh, and it's also a, a good uh, host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. But for birds, it's got 50, those fruits have 50% uh, fat, which is a great uh, energy resource. Uh, high bush blueberry and low bush blueberry. What, uh, what, fruit, what more could a bird ask for than blueberries? Well, here's something else it could ask for earlier in the year, Juneberry or serviceberry or shadbush. Uh, and I understand why birds love this uh, fruit because so do I. Uh, it is absolutely delicious, just as good as blueberries. This beautiful ornamental tree, again, a native tree um, in, in fantastic bloom in May, uh, beautiful all seasons. Uh, landscapers love this tree, Juneberry. Here's an, another Eddie Medi Ento Ornithomental uh, because the, it's, you know, it has pollinator benefit. Uh, birds are attracted to the fruit. And the fruit is also uh, edible and medicinal for humans. Crab apple, uh, quite popular as an ornamental, and it's great for both insect pollination and birds. Uh, birds love black cherry and choke cherry, so do the uh, pollinators uh, going after the flowers. And here's another one, aronia or black choke berry, not choke cherry. This is not a cherry at all. It's a, it's a, sh a shrub which has often been grown or for an, as an ornamental. Um, because it certainly is stunningly beautiful in all seasons, uh, but those fruits are also edible for both humans and birds. Don't taste great right off the shrub, but if you cook with them, they're fantastic. And also another medicinal plant for humans as well. Uh, if, now, if you wanted to learn about the, the uh, practical uh, questions about planting a particular species, just, vis just uh, type Missouri, which is short for Missouri Botanical Garden, and the name of the plant, either the common name or the Latin name, and you'll come up with this page uh, of information plus a couple of paragraphs additionally to describe the plant. And it's, it's helpful to know how big the plant's going to be at maturity, the height and the spread, and when it'll bloom and uh, the water needs, the sun and water needs, the maintenance needs, uh, and you'll see what it attracts. Uh, it tolerates wet soil and garden locations. If you click on that, you'll find out where this uh, plant could be purchased. Uh, blackberries, black raspberries, staghorn sumac, more fruits for birds. This fruit actually persists into the beginning of the winter. Uh, and long, uh, even now with the beginning of spring, there are still some winter berries left on those trees. This is a dioecious tree. The male, uh, the male tree is required uh, so that pollinators can bring pollen from that male tree and then fertilize the uh, female trees that have the female flowers in order to set that fruit. Uh, Northern Bayberry, a welcome site for hungry birds in the middle of winter, a good uh, survival food. And then uh, the conifers, which provide seed that's edible for some birds and a uh, good place to nest, good place for shelter in the middle of a storm. Uh, also many uh, caterpillars, that no less than 200 different species of moth and butterfly caterpillar actually uh, visit pine needles and uh, th then they become food for the birds. And the Eastern red cedar uh, fruits are also edible. Um, now, when, you've, when you're thinking about what you want to plant where, um, pay attention to 
uh, what's called microhabitats, because different places on your property might have different amounts of our different amounts of sunlight. They might be moister or drier, uh, depending on you know where you are in the topography. Uh, the soil texture may even vary, and uh, ideally you have loam, which is a kind of an, a, a balance of sand, silt, and clay. Um, and some plants do quite well in sandy soil. Some plants can handle quite clay sale, soil, and others. Um, uh, and just about everything is, is happy right in the middle. And if it's loam, like ba that balance of uh, those three. Uh, compaction, however, is something that no plant can handle. If the soil is, is uh, so compacted then the roots can't get through, there's no vegetation that can, that can grow there. Um, you can do a test for compaction simply by straightening a wire coat hanger, plunging it into the, um, uh, plunging it one foot in uh, to the soil. And if you can, move it around uh, and the, the wire hanger does not bend, then you're okay. It's not overly compacted. But if, if, it's so, if it's so tight there that just trying to move it, it bends the wire hanger, then you've got a problem and you need to research what to do about it. Um, the four, um, uh, uh, the soil micronutrients, soil fertility, pH and salinity at the bottom of the slide uh, could all be determined by a soil test. And uh, there are some of these that, that actually might vary from site to site on your property. Now, once you've decided where you're going to plant a tree or a shrub, uh, the extra wide hole is so that the, the roots can grow out. Roots don't need to grow down nearly as much as they need to grow out because there's so much more moisture and nutrients available near the surface and they have to access that, uh, that water and those nutrients. So uh, by digging a wide hole, you'll make it easier for the roots to travel laterally. Uh, keep the topsoil and subsoil in separate piles. And so when, you're, uh, when you've removed that burlap uh, and uh, you're ready to put the soil back in, first return the subsoil and then the topsoil to fill the hole. Uh, by surrounding the tree with mulch, even to, 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 to the drip line or even beyond, you're uh, reducing the competition that other vegetation, including your lawn, uh, will uh, uh, for the uh, nutrients and, and water. And if you put mulch on that, uh, that area so much the better, and you can make a rim around the, the sapling, which will serve as a bowl to hold the uh, rainwater or the water that you're adding. Uh, and don't forget to irrigate uh, your plant, your, uh, your saplings, at least for the first couple of years, uh, if, if uh, you have a dry period and uh, th that plant might need some helping out. However, there is such a thing as overwatering. Be aware of that. Now, you'll want to protect sap saplings in some cases for if you have if you know you have a, a lot of pressure from uh, hungry vegetarians such as uh, rabbits and woodchucks and the like. Uh, so here's some d devices to accomplish that. Um, uh, on with the show now. The other fruits that are attracted to birds: this vine, Virginia creeper, that we cannot eat this fruit, but birds can. Uh, and, and either of these wild grape species, very, very appealing to birds. Uh, this uh, wild honeysuckle or limber honeysuckle, the mockingbird and catbird can both make use of that and, and also make use of the vine just for, for shelter or nesting. Uh, bearberry, what a beautiful ground cover this is. It requires full sun. It's an evergreen and uh, it, uh, bears eat the fruits, but so do birds. Uh, what bird wouldn't uh, eagerly consume sunflower seeds? Uh, and there are many other uh, plants in this family that's called the Asteraceae, the aster family that sunflower is a member of, such as black-eyed Susan. Uh, these seeds are also edible for birds. So are purple coneflower seeds. And every plant on this page, um, with the exception of sedum at the bottom, uh, is another member of the aster family. So that's a kind of a safe generalization that uh, members of the Asteraceae family uh, provide edible seeds for birds. So here are some of those, uh, the, these first, first four or first five, gay feather also. Notice there are a couple of species that are grass uh, that, uh, that have edible seeds for uh, birds. So if we leave those seed stalks standing over winter, that gives the birds a chance to uh, get some nourishment from them. And likewise, if you can leave the leaves wherever possible, um, for example, under a under a shrub or, or serving as mulch around a tree. Uh, and uh, because that provides habitat for a number of insects, butterflies and moths and other insects that can be um, uh, a meal for birds as well. 
uh, leave dead trees and snags for habitat for birds that they can uh, establish nests in them or find insects there as well. And brush piles for the three S's, sanctuary, shelter, and snacks. They can uh, fly in there for protection from predators. They can seek shelter and they can find edible uh, little crustaceans and insects and the like. So remember birds need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. And the best ways to, to give them that is with habitat. Um, uh, gardening for wildlife connects us to nature, but too often our modern standards for what a landscape is supposed to look like uh, pays no attention whatsoever to habitat and, and has a, a kind of a very controlled, uh, neat look. Uh, the lawn in particular all started out as a status symbol several centuries ago with the aristocracy in Britain who could demonstrate their wealth by not, uh, they didn't need to, uh, you know, demonstrating that they didn't need to use their land to grow food and they could hire people to uh, use a scythe to cut their lawns. So uh, we're still living with this uh, uh, kind of standard of what we're supposed to do with our property. And, but unfortunately, lawns are a food desert, they are a polluter, and they are a resource guzzler. Uh, far more pesticides are used on lawns than, are, than on agricultural land per acre. Uh, an unconscionable amount of water uh, to mow our lawn. And, and consider the fact that Kentucky bluegrass is a non-native grass. It's not from Kentucky, actually, it's from Eurasia. And while uh, it might do fine in Britain, uh, with their uh, moist or wet summers. We don't have wet summers typically. So uh, Kentucky bluegrass is a grass on life support here in America. Uh, instead, you might want to uh, transition to a turf type tall fescue simply by seeding in uh, this species. Uh, the roots can go as deep as, as deep as four feet. So uh, of course they won't need watering, uh, uh, perhaps not, not ever, and they'll need, they need less fertilizer less mowing, uh, they, they're fine in the shade or sun, and it looks almost uh, indistinguishable from Kentucky bluegrass. So if you have a part of your uh, property that's uh, problematic for shade or standing water or erosion, why not, uh, instead of uh, just frustrating yourself trying to get lawn to grow there, plant native perennials, shrubs, and trees. Uh, I invite you to visit Marianne Borges' website, thenaturalweb.org, for interesting articles on all kinds of different topics and for fantastic photography as well. Environmental organizations are asking us to reduce our lawns by 25% at least. I think that's a reasonable goal, and not only will we be helping wildlife, uh, providing habitat, habitat, a wildlife sanctuary, if you will, but we'll also be providing a sanctuary for, our, for ourselves, for our souls, as we uh, just in, 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 admire and find stimulation in such an environment. Now, uh, here the folks on the left have seen the light, but the folks on the right have, are concerned about the whole idea of nat natural landscaping. And, and we have to address certain myths such as, well, no, natural landscapes don't attract vermin and uh, Lyme disease ticks can be a problem. It's a legitimate concern, but uh, if you plan it right and have setbacks or paths for walking, uh, then ticks have no way to attach themselves to you. You won't, if you don't make contact with plants, uh, then, then ticks have no way to attach. Uh, I invite you to, to visit LymeDisease.org for more information on preventing ticks in your yard. You can buy repellents that have any of these four ingredients in them. And you can also spray your clothing and gear with permethrin at least 48 hours before use. It not only repels, it actually kills ticks, mosquitoes, tiggers, mites, and other insects that come in contact with it. It'll last through six washings. Uh, and if you buy factory treat, treated clothing, that lasts through 70 washings. Great stuff. Uh, here are some natural methods of tick control. Uh, and so once again, uh, it's when we're doing nature a favor, nature does us a favor. Uh, well, how about mosquitoes? Uh, I would say that lawns are, uh, lawn dominated landscapes are more likely to have standing puddles than uh, natural landscapes. But if you uh, are interested in having a pond, which is great for wildlife, um, stagnant water is where uh, mosquitoes want to breed. Uh, and if, if you uh, provide your pond with a solar activated pump, if, that, if, uh, if that's a possibility, that will deal with the problem. You can also stock the pond with koi, goldfish, or mosquito fish. And there's a bacterium called BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. They're called mosquito dunks and mosquito bits that have this bacterium, and they, they're very effective 
at eliminating mosquito larvae. Uh, allergenic pollen is not an issue in natural landscapes because it's actually the non-native plants and grasses that produce the most allergenic pollen. The weeds such as ragweed, uh, goldenrod is, is often unfairly blamed. Goldenrod is not uh, allergenic. It does not have wind-worn pollinate, uh, pollen. Uh, pollinators actually uh, pick up the pollen from the flowers and deliver that pollen to the uh, another goldenrod plant. Uh, so it's the windborne uh, pollen from allergenic weeds like ragweed, lamb's quarters, red root amaranth, English plantain, and some of the non-native grasses as well. Those are problematic, um, but uh, not the plants that you're likely to establish. Uh, and as for property values, well, it certainly is not necessary uh, for a property, property to be messy and unattractive. In fact, it could be um, stunningly beautiful and it's been demonstrated that the addition of simply of only one tree to a property can enhance the value of that property by thousands of dollars. Uh, and if the entire landscaping is done tastefully, uh, you can imagine what a boost in property value that would represent. Uh, one way to do a, uh, to, to make an impression uh, with plants in a natural planting is to have just one species or maybe just two. Um, that are mixed together, uh, they can make quite a, a statement or just ensure that there are plenty of flowers blooming throughout the seasons. Uh, and you will want to have some plants against the foundation. Uh, notice also in this, in this photo that there's a bird bath and a large pot with plants in it and, and paths. So anything that, that is done to a landscape to make it look intentional is, is helpful. Uh, containers, structures, and other objects such, uh, such as in this photo achieve that goal as well. Or sim simply the principles of design, crisp edges and bold patterns will be qu quite attractive. Um, so visit allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website and uh, for uh, more information on this topic. Uh, invasive plants can be uh, uh, such, uh, uh, have such a negative impact uh, because they displace our native plants. Um, and any planting that you do, uh, you'll be frustrated if you don't first uh, take an inventory of those invasive plants, find out what's already there, um, and make a realistic plan about how to eliminate or control their population uh, and follow through with that plan. Japanese knotweed is uh, um, one of the worst, and uh, you, uh, it is possible to dig out the roots, uh, but don't expect that to solve the problem because uh, even a small piece of root left uh, behind and it's impossible to get all the root uh, when you dig, um, will send up a new plant. However, uh, just a couple of days ago, I did, um, uh, there, was, there was a fairly manageable size. I didn't, it only took me a couple of hours to really dig up some, uh, the, the large roots. And I know that uh, they'll come back, but they won't come back nearly as vigorously as they otherwise would have if I allowed those large roots to stay in the soil. And, and then I can simply um, keep at it. And uh, if you uh, keep uh, harvesting or cutting those uh, shoots back uh, regularly for every three weeks or so uh, throughout the growing season and do that for maybe two, three or four years, uh, those roots will eventually give up. Incidentally, those shoots are edible. If you like anything with the uh, rhubarb, uh, Japanese knotweed shoots are a substitute for uh, rhubarb. Oriental bittersweet is a terrible uh, vine that chokes and, and kills trees. Uh, it girdles them. And uh, so uh, if you have uh, this vine on your property and if it's reached the canopy of any of your trees, be sure to lop them at the ground for, for starters to make sure they can't uh, grow any more of those flowers and seeds that will be eaten by the birds and spread all over. And, and try to uproot this plant wherever it's found. Autumn olive is a non-native shrub that's nitrogen fixing and, and has a, a serious advantage over our native shrubs. Uh, here's another one, Multiflora rose, another non-native shrub that's made itself far too welcome on our property. And burning bush, is no, it's no longer uh, legal to sell uh, burning bushes because they are so invasive. Goutweed, garlic mustard, and black swallowwort are examples of herbaceous plants that'll take over. And there are certainly more than the ones I've listed. So visit masslive.com, uh, invasive plants in Massachusetts to see to learn more about invasive plants. Uh, 
migrating birds prefer native fruits. They, they somehow know that they are more nutritious than these invasives such as Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose, even when the invasives are far more common and they are you know, marginally edible, but birds don't prefer them. Uh, poison ivy is a native plant and birds do eat the fruits of poison ivy. But if you want to uh, control poison ivy or any other unwanted plant on your property, uh, why, why bother going to all the trouble of digging or rototilling when you can simply smother the vegetation? Uh, that's actually also being kinder to the uh, microbes, uh, the no-dig approach or the no-till approach. Uh, so if you use um, uh, cardboard uh, or, uh, or newspaper is also an alternative, uh, six thicknesses of uh, six sheets of, of newspaper and overlapping by uh, several inches to make sure no vegetation can poke through. And then you, after soaking that barrier layer, uh, you will cover with uh, mulch, and that's why it's called sheet mulching. Notice in the lower right photo on this slide, you'll see a roll of something, it's called ram board. And so if you have a large area, you can order ram board um, to, uh, to cover that area uh, if you can't source enough cardboard or newspaper for the job. Uh, benefits of mulch include suppressing weeds, keeping the soil moist and cool, and enriching the soil. Uh, and the types of mulch that you can use, if you're growing a vegetable garden, for example, or, or uh, gardening for uh, annuals, such as, you know, annual uh, flowers, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine needles are all fine. Pine needles are uh, un, uh, uh, mistakenly believed by many people to, uh, um, to cause uh, the, the soil to become acidic, which it, it's, it's simply not true. They, uh, they resi resist decomposition for quite a long time. And even when they eventually become compost, it's just compost, it's not acidic. Uh, so for perennial beds, you can also use shredded leaves and, and pine needles, or you could use pine bark, sawdust. Wood chips are great and chip branch wood is also good. Um, branches that come, that are fed to it through a chipper have the, just the right uh, balance of nitrogen and carbon. Avoid dyed mulch. It is often contaminated with creosote and CCA. Um, and don't overuse mulch. You don't want to do a volcano mulch on, around your tree because that will encourage it to send roots out into that mulch and those roots will become exposed as the mulch decomposes. Uh, and here's a rain garden. Uh, notice here, uh, you don't really need any mulch because, well, the plants uh, have taken over. <laughs> the plants that you have established there are now uh, filling the space and uh, there's no, no longer any need for mulch because they are doing the job of keeping that soil uh, free of weeds uh, and cool and moist uh, by their own shade. Uh, and in the case of this rain garden, uh, it, the water is being fed by, um, uh, you know, from, from the roof, it's being funneled uh, right uh, via the gutter right to that rain garden. And if there's any excess water, it comes out the bottom, you'll see that pebble path at the bottom of this photo. Uh, you can use ground covers as a living mulch. Consider that uh, they prevent weeds and they retain moisture and keep the soil cool just like other mulches do. And in addition, they can hold the soil in place on slopes and they can be quite beautiful uh, and permanent where uh, mulches can't be permanent. They'll simply decompose. So remember bearberry is one kind of mulch, one of my favorites uh, in the full sun, it's an evergreen. Uh, thyme is great for beekeepers because thyme oil is, is uh, uh, a, pr a pr pr protector of bees that'll, from uh, varroa mites. Um, Three-leaf sink foil, another uh, evergreen that's stunningly beautiful. Uh, golden star with those fantastic yellow flowers. Uh, wild ginger can handle dense shade. It might take a while to establish, but it's, a, it's a remarkable how it, it can uh, be in dense shade. And here's another shade tolerant ground cover, Bishop's hat. Allegheny Pachysandra is a native Pachysandra, and I think it's much more attractive than the Japanese Pachysandra that's so ubiquitous. Barren strawberry is a good choice for a ground cover, and so is wild strawberry. And uh, so on with the show, hummingbirds are beneficial because they are both predators and pollinators. They are extremely efficient uh, in, in, and uh, at hunters, they, uh, they can pluck insects out of the air or they can find them elsewhere as well. Um, and the ruby-throated hummingbird is the only hummingbird that you're likely to see here in New England. Um, 
we don't need to be concerned about their population. They've doubled in size since uh, in the last half century, uh, but people love hummingbirds and in order to attract them to your property, provide moving water, uh, a place for them to rest, such as this, uh, this perch here, uh, dead trees where holes have been drilled by woodpeckers, uh, have sap in them that uh, is attractive to insects, which then the hummingbird can help itself to. Uh, and hummingbirds need spider silk to make their webs. Uh, and remarkably, as those two eggs hatch and as the chicks grow, the nest will grow because it's made of, uh, sp of uh, spider silk. The spider silk is elastic and the entire nest uh, is, uh, will expand to uh, double its original size. It is okay to rescue a hummingbird or any other bird uh, that a chick, if you find it, uh, on the ground. It's not true that uh, the parent will reject it because it, it has the human scent on it. Um, hummingbird feeders uh, can be offered. Uh, please don't use red dye uh, because they all have enough of the color red on them as part of the design. And this particular design of a hummingbird feeder is preferable to many others because it's easy to detach uh, the, the lower half, uh, just unscrews, and then you can uh, easily clean both halves and then reattach them. Uh, and don't use anything except just plain white sugar, a uh, four to one uh, ratio, uh, heat to dissolve it, refrigerate, use within one week, and replace the food every few days, clean that feeder every three days uh, with hot tap water, scrub the sides, don't use soap, soap residue is bad for the hummingbirds. If you see black mold, you'll have to deal with that uh, by soaking your feeder in a solution of bleach and water, one to 64 ratio for one hour. Uh, the nectar will become cloudy and spoil often in hot weather. In fact, that can happen in just one day. So uh, there is so much responsibility involved uh, in uh, making sure that we are helping rather than harming hummingbirds by offering sugar water. And actually I would rather offer them natural nectar, which has just the right balance of the different fruit uh, sugars that they need. Um, but floral nectar also has uh, trace elements, minerals, proteins, and amino acids, which are, uh, essential in their diets. Trumpet creeper is, is not advisable to plant near your dwelling. Uh, it'll, uh, it's, it's way too uh, aggressive. Uh, it might do, actually do some damage uh, to your sighting or what have you. But uh, if you have a place in the landscape for it, uh, there's just, it's so prolific and there's so many flowers available to a large number of hummingbirds. Here's another wonderful vine, the trumpet honeysuckle. And uh, the fabulous, uh, stunningly beautiful cardinal flower uh, which also is uh, attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, cardinal flower uh, likes moist soil, but it can handle normal soil as well. Wild columbine blooms in the spring. So those hu hungry hummingbirds that have just arrived on their migration to New England have, uh, have wild columbine to uh, pollinate. Uh, butterfly weed is another one that's attractive to hummingbirds. In fact, just about anything that they sample and that if it has a good a nectar sort, a, a supply of nectar, they will, uh, they will make use of that resource. Anisysip is a fantastic pollinator plant. It's in the mint family, attracting a wide variety of different insects and hummingbirds as well. Obedient plant, another mint that's quite a effective pollinator plant. Blazing star also, uh, swamp milkweed, fox club beard tongue blooming in the spring, purple coneflower and any flock species. So bats are also beneficial because they are predators. In fact, that's all they eat is, uh, is uh, insects uh, and uh, they need our help. The little brown bat and the big brown bat are the two uh, most common uh, bats in New England. The little brown bat population has been decimated by uh, actually by 90% due to white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease. So we can provide clean uh, roosts that don't have that disease and give them uh, it's, it's unlikely, by the way, that uh, bats will take up residence in a house unless there's a source of water uh, reasonably close. Um, but uh, we can uh, either build or buy bat houses and put them up and offer them to bats as, as habitat. Um, it's, it's not uh, legal to evict bats in the middle of the uh, summer because they'll be raising their pups then. So visit mass.gov for more information about evicting bats safely. Leave dead trees standing for habitat for, for bats and don't use pesticides. 
keep your cats indoors. Cats can uh, wipe out a colony of bats uh, if they find out uh, where they are. And minimize artificial lighting because that's disruptive and disturbing to bats. So lepidopterans are the, uh, include both butterflies and moths and they are important pollinators. Butterflies uh, are the more colorful ones that, that we uh, uh, are most drawn to and are most appealing to us. Moths are actually 20 times as numerous as butterflies, both in terms of diversity and numbers. Uh, and they are more commonly active during the night uh, while butterflies are out in the daytime. Uh, moths have feather-like antennae and butterflies have club-tipped antennae. Uh, and butterflies make chrysalises while moths spin cocoons. 33% uh, population reduction in only two decades was observed in a population of butterflies in Ohio. This is quite alarming. And again, habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change are the culprits. And uh, uh, an insect apocalypse is upon us if, we, if these alarming declines in population continue. Uh, this was a study in Germany that found a 75% loss in the insect population over 27 years. Uh, a world without insects is not a world that we want to or, or can live in. A flowerless world with silent forests, no birds left, a world of dung and old leaves and rotting carcasses, uh, a world of collapse or decay um, spiraling uh, from predators to plants. Uh, so uh, butterflies are undoubtedly the most appealing uh, pollinators out there. And so that's why butterfly gardening is so popular. And, uh, and if you're providing the, the right conditions for butterflies, you'll also be providing conditions that are good for other pollinators as well. Uh, sun is one consideration. Full sun is defined as at least six hours of sun. Uh, well, being near a water source can be handy to keep the, the, those new, new uh, plants irrigated. Shelter from the wind is useful for butterflies. Host plants, absolutely essential. So those caterpillars can grow and, and uh, metamorphosize. Um, Butterfly gardening, also uh, nectar producing plants throughout the growing season is a must and organic landscaping practice is very important. Butterfly boxes, on the other hand, are totally unnecessary and useless. No one has ever found a butterfly in a butterfly box. Bottom line, uh, sometimes you can find spiders in them, sometimes wasps, but never butterflies. Uh, but uh, mud is something else. Males often need to, it's called puddling when they uh, they actually uh, insert their proboscis into the mud, They're, they are able to ingest the uh, minerals that are in mud and they use those minerals to make the pheromones which attract uh, chemicals that attract females. And when they mate with the females, they are able to uh, pass those minerals onto the eggs and help them with their chances of survival. Uh, we can give butterflies mud with a, a repurposed butterfly, uh, repurposed bird bath, uh, or a saucer that's recessed into the ground uh, and use gravel or sand, add salt or compost for the minerals and keep it moist. Butterflies often like fruit and don't seem to care if it's going bad. So uh, see what you're gonna attract putting out a, 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 a platter of fruit and uh, butterflies might come and help themselves. And the host plants are absolutely essential. Uh, here is are the four, uh, uh, first, second, and third, and fourth place winners in the uh, category of native plants that attract the most different species of moths and butterflies. So goldenrod is in first place with 125 different species. Wild strawberry, second place, 81. Sunflower, 58. And bird's foot trefoil, 32. And there are many others that are important as well. Uh, but there's nothing like the trees and shrubs, a, a stunning 473 different species of moths and butterflies for, on an oak tree. 411 different species on these genus, uh, the beech plum, cherry, choke cherry, anything in the prunus genus. Willows are a very important uh, plant, uh, not only for host, uh, as a host plant, but also a pollinator plant in the spring. Birch is another uh, winner. Now, uh, there are some uh, plants, there are some species of butterfly that can only use uh, a limited number uh, the spice bush swallowtail is an example of a host plant. The, the, the female will only lay her egg on either a spice bush leaf or a sassafras leaf because those are the only two species that the caterpillar is able to, uh, to uh, feed on. 
uh, black swallowtail on, uh, uh, will feed on any of the members of the parsley family, parsley, dill, carrots, fennel. Uh, the Baltimore checker spot caterpillar feeds on leaves of turtle head and plantain. And the host plants for the spring azure are New Jersey tea, viburnums, meadowsweet, and dogwoods. Great spangled fritillary, uh, the, the common blue, uh, blue violet is called with those purple flowers. Sometimes they're white flowers. Uh, and that's the food source for the caterpillar of this wonderful butterfly. And the butterfly that all of us uh, know best and the one that's the most popular and, well, and, uh, and most studied and, uh, is, is the monarch butterfly. Uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars can only eat milkweed leaves, but common milkweed is not advisable for your garden because it's, uh, it's way too aggressive. It's, some people would call it a thug in your garden. Uh, it'll send out roots uh, and travel all over uh, where you don't want it to be. So instead of inviting a catastrophe like that, I suggest that you plant either swamp milkweed or butterfly weed in your garden. Poke weed, milkweed would, would be appropriate for a shady place. Uh, as the name implies, swamp milkweed can handle moist soil, but it can also do fine in normal soil. Butterfly weed, on the other hand, can tolerate dry soil and likewise can do fine in normal soil. So these are the two, swamp milkweed and butterfly weed that are most likely to work, work out well for you in your butterfly garden. Uh, monarchs uh, are in trouble. Uh, the, the numbers are way down. Monarchwatch.org is, is the place to go to find out about uh, efforts to help them. And uh, it's the glyphosate being applied to uh, uh, agricultural uh, GMO crops uh, that is killing all the milkweed uh, and reducing uh, the numbers of, of uh, monarchs in that way. So you can establish a monarch way station and uh, order one of these signs from monarchwatch.org to uh, uh, to proudly proclaim to the world that you're part of the effort to help them survive. Uh, and here is an example of a monarch garden, a monarch way station garden that uh, you could install. You can go to edibleterrace.com to learn more about these, this uh, particular um, design and, and the plants that are included in it. Notice that uh, two of, the, of these 12 plants are actually grasses. And also notice that the, uh, each species is planted in clusters. That way the butterflies won't have to travel so far from flower to flower to when they're working one particular kind of plant. Uh, Sharon Stichter uh, provided a, a list of top 15 butterfly plants for the North American Butterfly Association, that's naba.org, um, about a decade ago. And when she included butterfly bush on her list, she was perhaps not aware of two uh, Im important points that although it's, uh, uh, it's certainly true that butterflies are attracted to the nectar of this uh, butterfly bush. And, and so uh, it's, and it's a, a, many people consider it to be an attractive shrub as well. However, it's not a host plant for any butterfly or moth species. And more importantly, it seems to be invasive here in Massachusetts and will probably continue, uh, will, will be more so as our climate changes. So we're better off planting natives. Here's a New Jersey tea, a shrub that's very attractive to butterflies. Uh, sweet pepper bush is another one. Uh, compass plant, a very tall perennial. It's also called cup plant. Notice how the leaves join and, and encircle the stem, creating a little basin so when it rains, there's water there that can be a, a source of drinking water for birds or butterflies or other insects. Blazing star, a beautiful native plant. Uh, thistle can be somewhat weedy, but it's, it's on the list in terms of ones that attract butterflies. So, is, so are the asters and purple coneflower and scabiosa and joe pieweed, which is a tall perennial. It can grow in moist places, but also in normal soil. The same can be true of bone set, a moist, uh, moist, uh, tolerant of moist conditions, but also does fine uh, in normal, normal draining soil. Uh, and, and again, the milkweeds, not only as uh, a host plant for the monarchs, but it's a pollinator plant for all sorts of different wonderful uh, insects and pollinators that uh, these, these unusual flowers are very, uh, have, a, have fantastic nectar um, reservoirs. Uh, 
Uh, and, the, and then the following three annuals uh, are recommended, zinnia, Mexican sunflower, and marigolds for butterfly attractants. Uh, but think about, uh, are you planting anything that the deer might eat? Uh, and you might want to visit the, uh, this, uh, uh, either the Cornell Cooperative Extension or the New England Wildflower Society has lists of deer resistant native plants. Uh, here are some more hungry vegetarians, uh, rabbits and woodchucks. Uh, so you can learn again, Cornell Cooperative Extension has information about uh, ways either to, uh, well, one, one approach is actually just to give them what they like. You know, the alfalfa is, is great for groundhogs and maybe they'll stay away from your plants. Um, and what if you don't have any appreciable amount of land? You could. Uh, think about container gardening. The larger the container, the better, because you won't have to uh, water it too often. And you do need to use potting soil, normal soil from the uh, from uh, the from the ground. Simply is not uh, uh, is not appropriate for a, a container gardening. Um, and the the strip of land between the road and the sidewalk can be a stunning, uh, just visually. Uh, Giving uh, giving the neighborhood a, a, a great boost and uh, and giving pollinators uh, the help that they need as well. Susanna Lerman has done research demonstrating that uh, that it's there's a, an easy way to provide habitat for pollinators in your lawn. Simply mow less often. Uh, mowing every other week makes a tremendous difference in allowing those lawn flowers to bloom. Uh, so she calls it a wildflower lawn, and she also calls it a bee and butterfly lawn, or a lazy lawnmower lawn, or a freedom lawn. But whatever you call it, it it's going to do the trick if, if, if you uh, uh, allow these uh, wonderful plants to grow. And uh, by uh, not using herbicides is, uh, is the bottom line, in addition to uh, mowing um, no closer than, say, three or four inches, and, and just waiting a little while and, and before you mow again. Wildflower meadows are uh, a bit of a project and a bit of an investment, but they can be stunningly beautiful and, and give significant uh, uh, wildlife benefit. So uh, extension.unh.edu is a great resource to learn about how to establish a wildflower meadow. Uh, it's a, it'll take a whole year uh, just to prepare the bed because you have to totally eliminate vegetation, not only what's growing there uh, uh, now, but also what would grow if you eliminated vegetation and allowed those seeds in, this, in the soil, which is called the seed bank, to germinate. They, they have to be eliminated as well. So smothering the land, if, if, you, if it's a manageable size, is one approach. And there are other ways to do this that you can learn about. Uh, I will say that it doesn't really make sense to have a wildflower meadow unless you have 400 square feet, but uh, that's not all that. Um, uh, you know, 20, 20 by 20 is, is, a, is a, many people would have that, uh, those dimensions available. Uh, you, you want a, a place with, with a lot of sun. Uh, and consider that even with that initial investment of preparing the land and of purchasing the seed, uh, once you've got it established, all you have to do is mow it every, uh, perhaps every year, every other year, just to keep those saplings and other plants that you don't want from seeding in. Uh, and by mowing in the spring and keeping those, uh, as, as I mentioned previously, uh, keeping those, allowing the, the plants to stand through the winter uh, will give some nourishment to birds and other uh, wildlife. Uh, so the bees are unquestionably the best pollinators because they have fuzzy bodies and the pollen sticks to their bodies more, more readily than butterflies or other pollinators. The honeybee is the one that we are the best, most uh, familiar with, and it's, and it's probably the most common uh, pollinator out there. Uh, but every time you see a honeybee, you're looking at someone's herd because we have virtually no feral honeybees anymore. They're all managed by people who are beekeepers. And it, it's a non-native, uh, it was brought over from Britain by the colonists. Uh, so before that time, we did not have honeybees, we, but there, we did have four, at least 400 different species of native bees here in Massachusetts, all different kinds of sizes uh, and having different habitat needs and, and pollinating different flowers. And 
uh, most of these are totally harmless in contrast to the honeybee, which as everyone knows, will, will sting you if you d disturb it or if you're near the hive. Um, so uh, we do need honeybees that, uh, because we're dependent on them for many of our crops and they also offer us honey, but honeybees actually can compete with our native bees in other ways and, uh, and can also cause the spread of diseases to those native bees. Uh, bees, uh, if you say that you've been stung by a bee, I, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll ask you first, is it possible that you might have been stung by a yellow jacket? Because that's far more likely to happen uh, by stepping on a yellow jacket nest. And a yellow jacket is not a bee, it's a wasp. Uh, as you can see, it has to, does not have that much hair and it, its legs dangle when flying. Uh, bumblebees are one of the kinds of native bee uh, that uh, the, it's, it's really the other kind of bee that people are familiar with, honeybees and bumblebees, um, and in part because of their size and also because how, of how common they are. Um, they have a corbicula uh, on each, each hind leg, which is a, it's kind of the consistency of bread dough. It's a combination of pollen that's uh, moistened with nectar. And so uh, they are gathering pollen, act actively gathering pollen as a food source uh, for protein to feed themselves and other members of their hive. Um, the, the female has to start the hive from scratch every uh, spring. So she'll seek out a place uh, that's a, like an abandoned bird nest or mouse nest or that, si that sort of thing that's protected from the elements. And she has to lay those eggs and provision the eggs, uh, keep, keep them fed and also uh, keep herself fed, fed as, as the, until the hive grows to the extent that uh, those offspring are helping with the management of the hive. Look, it looks very different as you can see from a honeybee hive. And while there are hundreds of bumblebees uh, in a colony, there are thousands of honeybees in a colony. Bumblebees are experts at pollinating tomato flowers because they, uh, they're able to access the pollen which is inside the anther which that's an unusual uh, uh, place for pollen to be. Usually the pollen is on the outside. Uh, so the bumblebee attaches itself to the anthers which are all joined and um, vibrates the flower with its muscles, thoracic muscles at just the right frequency. And you can hear the hum of this vibration which is a different hum than when you hear it uh, uh, flying around. And that vibration causes the pollen to become dislodged and uh, the pollen gets emptied out onto its body and it goes into the corbiculae. Here's some more uh, bumblebee pollinated crops, raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers. Uh, Turtlehead is a native flower that only bumblebees can pollinate because no other bee can, can uh, force its way all the way down uh, into that tubular flower. And it's quite funny to watch a, a bumblebee go in there and watch the flower move around, almost like the, fl the flower is eating the bee. Uh, bottle gentian is another example of a flower that only a bumblebee can access uh, by forcing its way into this closed uh, tubular flower. Uh, there are no more rusty patched bumblebees in, in New England. None, none has been seed for a decade and there are very few of them anywhere left, left anywhere uh, in our country. And the American bumblebee likewise is threatened um, in, in Massachusetts. The two that are the most common, the mo most likely to be seen are the common Eastern bumblebee and the two spotted bumblebee and others, and they're actually more numerous than they used to be, but others have declined considerably due to climate change, loss of habitat, and in addition, pests, pathogens, pesticides, poor nutrition, uh, the just lack of uh, habitat of the flowers that they need to visit, uh, and that pollution also because uh, bees uh, can't find the odors of plants if, the, if, the, if pollution is masking those odors. And no, plants that are non-natives and invasives are also part of the problem. So we can leave abandoned mouse and bird nests, which are valuable habitat for bumblebees. And in general, leave it be landscaping is an important principle for uh, establishing wildlife uh, sanctuaries. Uh, we can either make or buy bumblebee nesting boxes, and there's a chance that bumblebees will take up residence in one of them. Um, there are, in fact, some insects that look like bumblebees but aren't, and that's a, a nature's way of protecting those, those, th these two species of fly from predators. Sweat bees are charming little bees that are beautifully colored, 
um, they are solitary ground dwelling. Uh, they, they pollinate all kinds of different flowers um, and they're called sweat bees because they like this, the smell and taste of our perspiration. It's a, that has minerals that they can use, but this, this is a totally harmless bee. Uh, and the remarkable plasterer bee is actually able to create a plastic bag and then provision uh, the inside of that plastic bag in, in the cavity that, is, that it is dug in the sand or the soil um, so that the egg can uh, feast on that food, uh, the combination of pollen and nectar, and then emerge in the spring as an adult bee. A remarkable adaptation for protecting that egg and that insect. We can, and ground nesting bees act, act, actually comprise 70% of all native bees. 70% of native bees are ground nesters. Um, so we can provide places for them to uh, dig their tunnels uh, that are devoid of vegetation about several yards across or so. Loose well-drained soil is good, flat areas or earthen banks. Uh, a sunny and south facing slope would be ideal. And you can even use soil filled planters and stay off that area so that you don't disturb them. The mason bee is not a ground dwelling uh, bee. It's actually a cavity nesting bee. And there are, mason bees are far more efficient pollinators than honeybees on uh, apple trees and other orchard flowers. The reason for this is that they are much more likely after visiting a flower to then fly to a different tree and then deliver that pollen to that tree and pick up uh, pollen from that tree. Uh, where, whereas honeybees are much more likely to go from one flower to the next to the next on the same tree uh, offering no pollination, pollinator benefit or, or much less uh, because they're staying on the same tree for so long. Uh, it, and this is how they, uh, this is why they're called mason bees. They use mud to partition the chambers that they lay their eggs in. And another cavity nesting bee is the leaf cutter bee, which remarkably is able to cut these perfect circles out of leaf blades and then roll them up and stuff them into cavities because that's how the chambers are created for the, by this leaf cutter bee for the, the egg chambers. Um, so leaf cutter bees uh, visit blueberries, onions, carrots, alfalfa, and pollinate those crops. Here are some of the leaves that leaf cutter bees might use. Uh, and tick, tree, tick trefoil, the one at the, on the bottom row here, is the plant that I have in my garden. And I noticed uh, that there indeed were some of these neat holes cut in it. I was so thrilled. Uh, to see that uh, leaf cutters were part of my pollinator garden. Uh, the photo in the lower right of this slide is a rose bush, and some uh, owners of rose bushes might be alarmed to see those uh, uh, sections of leaves cut out, uh, but it, they actually are doing no harm to the plant because there's still plenty of leaf surface left on those leaves to provide for the uh, photosynthesizing that uh, plant that plant needs. So someone drilled three holes in this piece of wood and a leaf cutter bee used the top hole. Uh, there are about a half dozen different uh, chambers of leaf cutter bees here. A rosin bee moved into the third, to, into the middle when using rosin for the chambers. And then the mason bee using mud, uh, you'll see the cocoons here that are growing in, in that cavity. We can provide uh, for these cavity dwelling bees with, uh, uh, by putting out a, a nest box that has uh, hollow stalks of a variety of species. And notice Japanese knotweed, which is a pernicious weed, as I mentioned, the, the dead stalks from last year uh, can be cut up into sections and inserted their, their ideal, uh, offering that range of between 3 32nd of an inch wide and 3 8 of an inch wide. And the longer it is, the, this, uh, the, the, the wider it is, the longer it needs to be anywhere from three inches to six inches deep. And people actually collect the cocoons. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to the slide pointing out that, that someone is wrapping uh, a piece of paper around a dowel or a pencil it also could be used. And then that will be inserted into the stock. Uh, and so when the, the cavity nesting bee uh, uses that, uh, that stock, um, those, uh, they, those cocoons can be harvested and the ones that are diseased can be eliminated and uh, the, the remaining healthy cocoons are refrigerated for the entire winter, kept safe in the refrigerator and released in the summer when all danger of cold weather has passed. 
uh, and allowing those bees to emerge uh, in a, it's called a release box that simply is a box with a hole in it where they can fly out. And so I'd, I'd like to show some plants that uh, for your consideration for attracting native bees. And, and in first place, wild bergamot, uh, it, it attracts, you'll see the, the uh, green number in the upper left here, 15 different native bee genera, no other plant is, is, has, has reached that figure. Wild bergamot, it's a uh, Monarda fistulosa. It, it's, uh, quite, it's cl closely related to the uh, bee balm, Monarda, Monarda didyma, the, the red blooming uh, mint that looks a lot like this, uh, which is also a val valuable pollinator plant in its own right. Uh, Black-eyed Susan comes in second place, attracting 14 native bee genera. Bone set, 13. Uh, six plants are tied for fourth place at 12. Samp, swamp, milkweed, butterfly weed, tick seed, oxeye, sunflower, mountain mint, blue vervain. Um, I'd like to make a, 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 the case for why you'd want to uh, give special consideration to mountain mint. It blooms for a long time uh, and will attract many thousands of insect uh, visits over that, the course of that time. Uh, and the diversity is stunning. You get a lesson in entomology just watching all the insects that show up, including this great black wasp on the right, which is totally harmless and a beautiful insect, uh, tachinid fly, which is a beneficial insect, bumblebee, and so many others. Um, the, uh, this is a mint, uh, as the name implies, and the, the, uh, the leaves, if crushed uh, and applied to your skin, are an effective mosquito repellent. Uh, which lasts about half an hour or so. Uh, on with the show, the foxglove beard tongue, cup plant, New England aster and golden alexanders, quite popular with native bees, big leaf aster, wild geranium, yellow coneflower, anise hyssop, purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, uh, ironweed, a very tall plant, culver's root is, uh, can handle fairly dense shade, Coneflowers have, I should comment, uh, the, 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 type, the, the wild type is here in the upper left, but these, it's, uh, people love coneflowers so much that a hundred different varieties or cultivars have been invented by humans. Unfortunately, many of them are not useful to pollinators. Green jewel uh, simply cannot see, be seen by many pop pollinators and not recognized as a plant. Magnus, uh, has just doesn't have any poll pollen or nectar left in the flowers, just all petals. And Double Delight also has much of those floral resources gone. Um, on with the show, uh, Harebell, Wild Lupin, and Bloodroot uh, round out the plants that attract at least seven native genera. These plants, on, on, uh, by, uh, on the other hand, uh, are virtually useless in terms of uh, native bees or other bees pansy and daylily, hybrid rose, uh, tea rose, double marigold, petunia, New Guinea impatiens, begonia, peony, and forsythia. So many of these are quite popular as ornamentals because I, I suppose people are more familiar with them, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And when we recognize them as being of so low value, perhaps we'll consider replacing them with plants that are much more attractive to our pollinators. Now, we, we're talking here about beneficials and remember the predators and parasites are the other two of the peas. And uh, so spiders are efficient predators. They prey on everything possible. So do praying mantises. But the ones that are really the most beneficial are the predators that focus their efforts on the pests that gardeners and farmers need to have controlled. And so lacewing is a superb example of this. It's the uh, it's the larva of the lacewing that is, is, uh, is the predator of those pest insects. And it's the uh, adult that with its wings, uh, a winged insect is actually, want, is, is actually a pollinator insect itself. Uh, and we can attract lacewings by providing a lacewing hotel, uh, a piece of cardboard rolled up and inserted into a plastic bottle with a, a bottom cut off and just hang, hung from a tree. Uh, ladybugs are, uh, you, you can see there are many different kinds of ladybug beetles. It's the larva that preys on those um, uh, aphids and other pests. And again, the adult ladybug beetle is a pollinator. Uh, you can uh, offer a ladybug hotel to ladybugs simply by putting some pine cones in a mesh bag. 
Uh, fireflies flies are beneficial because their prey is insect larvae, snails, and slugs. Uh, their numbers are decreasing. We can help them out by providing, providing low hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds and streams are good habitat. Don't use fertilizers or pesticides and please turn off your outdoor lights because those are disruptive to fire, fireflies as well. Assassin bugs are very efficient predators and so, are, so is the hoverfly or surfed fly. And once again, it's the larva that's the hunter and it's the adult that's the pollinator. Uh, wasps uh, can, uh, even this tiny trichogramma wasp is a, an a efficient uh, parasitic um, it, by laying its eggs in the eggs of much larger species it actually controls their population. Uh, and the braconid wasps are astounding at the number of different pests that they can target and efficiently do target. And the sheer uh, diversity of, of ichneumon wasps is, is quite impressive. Uh, so we can attract these predators and parasites by uh, many of the same pollinator plants that we've already seen uh, visiting, uh, being visited by the butterflies and native bees. These are members of the fennel family and dill family, Queen Anne's lace, carrot, flowers, and the asteraceae, the aster family, goldenrod, tansy, marigold, dandelion, boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, and aster are all examples. Uh, and the horse mint is a mint that I haven't discussed yet, but uh, it's, it's a great attractant to all different kinds of wasp species, and it's a stunning plant in, in your garden as well. Uh, bugleweed is uh, one of those lawn flowers that I mentioned earlier. Wild bergamot, remember that was the first place plant uh, for wild bees, and it's also great for predators and parasites, and the Yanis hyssop, again, very popular as a pollinator plant. Uh, and so gardeners and farmers are familiar this, with this term, integrated pest management, IPM. We can call it intelligent pest management as well, because why would you use toxins and harm the wildlife that is going to actually be beneficial to you uh, in doing so when you can use any of the following uh, methods? Barriers are, uh, are um, floating row covers is an example of a barrier that simply keeps the pests off your, the, bug, the plants that you're protecting. Companion plants can also uh, repel those insects and keep them away from the plants being cultivated. Hand picking can be feasible and organic uh, pesticides are far more um, desirable than chemical uh, methods. Another th consideration is that if, you are, uh, if you're doing a, a really excellent job of providing nourishment, to your plants. The healthier the plant is, the more well defended it is from pests and diseases. That's true of people and it's true of plants as well. Trees and shrubs for pollinators. Often we think about a pollinator garden with perennial, with herbaceous perennials uh, that die back every year to the ground, but uh, woody plants can be fantastic pollinator plants because they have so many flowers. Uh, the willow is probably the most important pollinator plant of them all because it provides those uh, floral resources, the pollen and nectar early in the spring and then for several weeks thereafter, an, a, really, a truly impressive variety of uh, insects will visit willows. And, and you don't need to have uh, really uh, wet conditions. You can have normal conditions as well and the will, willow will do fine. Um, so, and re remember also that willow is a fantastic plant, uh, a host plant for a number of different uh, butterfly and moth species. Uh, here are different species of witch hazels, so, uh, uh, some of which are vernal, some of which are autumnal um, in, in their flowering. Redbud, fantastically beautiful and very valuable pollinator plant. Fruit trees with their flowers. Uh, American plum is an example of a native fruit tree and, and, a, and beech plum is a shrub uh, that's just humming with insect life when those flowers are in bloom. Uh, black cherry and choke cherry, we've seen already. Uh, so both insects and birds can use them. Virginia rose and Carolina rose, beautiful uh, functional roses for pollinators. Um, Juneberry, again, a uh, uh, very valuable plant for, uh, for pollinators. And so are the maple and oak flowers, even though they don't have any petals, no showy petals on these flowers, they still do have the pollen and nectar. That, that is our nutritional resources. Basswood, a fantastic tree for, for bees. Uh, blueberries for bumblebees. Uh, red osier dogwood. Uh, nine bark, 
but please use the straight species that this Monlo cultivar with the dark leaves, people often like dark colored or reddish leaves, but those leaves are, are often not accessible to, um, to the insects such as the nine bark leaf beetle that could otherwise use that as a, a feeding resource. Winter berry holly is a great pollinator plant. Uh, so is staghorn, staghorn sumac and the viburnums and the native hydrangeas. Uh, mountain laurel is a shrub that can handle dense, uh, fairly dense shade and it's a great pollinator plant as well. So consider spring ephemerals. Uh, now is the time when they're coming up uh, before the, the trees and shrubs have leafed out. So if we have habitat that where we, where we can't put a, a butterfly garden because it's shady, well, uh, Think about putting bulbs there instead. Snowdrops, crocuses are quite important for bees. Grapes, hyacinth, Siberian squill. Wild bleeding heart is a native plant uh, and it can also bloom again in the fall. Uh, Bloodroot uh, is another one that's uh, a spring ephemeral. And annuals to consider. Uh, we've talked about sunflower, Mexican sunflower, zinnia. There's also spider flower. Uh, and any of these, ageratum, sweet alyssum, borage, Pineapple sage, cosmos are considered valuable pollinator plants as, as annuals. And then there are the cul culinary herbs, which if you allow them to flower, basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, and catmint, all are high value plants for pollinators. Now, Kathy Neal, who is, uh, he, she's now retired, uh, and the same website I referred uh, uh, to earlier with uh, uh, Wildflower Meadows is a good one for uh, establishing wildflower gardens. Here's a flowering card calendar that she has provided that shows when these different plants are in bloom and how long they are in bloom uh, in, in order of their appearance. Uh, a rule of thumb, you want to have at least three uh, plants in bloom at a time um, throughout the, the season. So there could be three spring blooming, three summer blooming, and three late summer and fall blooming plants in your garden at a minimum. And you'd also want from three to five individuals of each species. Uh, so uh, one way you can um, get those plants established, uh, the, the most economical way is to buy, uh, buy the seeds and plant them yourself. Many of those seeds require a cold treatment in order to break dormancy, because if you try planting them, putting them in the ground before uh, having a, a prolonged period of moisture and cool uh, be temperatures between 34 and 41 degrees, um, the, the seed has not experienced winter yet and refuses to germinate. So a refrigerator is an ideal way to break dormancy because it has just the right temperature. And uh, if you put the seeds in a plastic bag with vermiculite, or you could use sand with large seeds, moist paper towel for small seeds uh, in that plastic bag for a couple of months, and then you're good to go. Uh, those seeds are ready to uh, to, to plant. Wild Seed Project, I heartily recommend this website to learn about uh, how to plant seeds. And they, they also provide the seeds. You can, you can order them from Wild Seed Project. Uh, growing wildflowers for seed, from seed. Notice how these plants are, are crowded uh, and you might question whether that's healthy for them, but they seem to like company at first. Uh, and then once, once they do get big enough, it's time to put them in their own little compartments. These are called plugs and you can get a lot of plants uh, for very little uh, uh, expenditure by growing them, or you can actually buy plugs from nurseries. And uh, again, you'll be getting, uh, each, each plant will be a unique individual, genetic individual, where if you buy uh, the larger plants that cost more money, those also might be clones of, of one another and may not be as valuable. Uh, in terms of the ecology of your garden. Uh, vegetative propagation does have its place, even though uh, each, uh, each plant that you create will be a clone of the parent. But in this case, this is a, a swamp milkweed and I found a, a clump of four uh, stalks and I needed, uh, I just wanted to establish more uh, uh, plants in my garden. And since I already had the, some uh, genetic diversity, uh, I, I thought it would be useful to just uh, in, increase the, uh, you know, each one of those stalks um, using clippers to separate the, um, them uh, had enough root system so that I could plant each one out. Uh, and another way to uh, get one, one plant to make more is by burying the stem 
and inducing it to root and then cutting it off uh, from the parent. Vegetative propagation also can be accomplished through cuttings. And you'd wanna, after you cut a stem, you, will, you would remove the lower leaves and then uh, put it in a pot, keep it watered, and uh, it'll, it, that will induce it to form roots. I'm offering this list of native plant nurseries all over the state and also New England native plant seed companies uh, for uh, ways to find um, the, the plants or the seeds that you need. And again, if you send an email message to me, I'll provide this list to you. Uh, and think of these places as um, uh, not only resources where you can get the plants and seeds, but you can get information. Uh, so if, if, for example, you have uh, a, a problematic area where that's, that's wet or dry or shady, or it might be acidic or, or uh, uh, alkaline or something, um, ask the person at, the, uh, at one of these nurseries or uh, seed companies, what would, what would work for this situation? And they might well have the experience and knowledge uh, to uh, recommend, to have specific recommendations for you. A another way to uh, get some questions answered, for, perhaps you have a plant and you don't know what it is, you can send a photo to this. Uh, these are master gardeners, pa Tower Hill Hortline. Here's the phone number, here's the email address. Uh, and you, and uh, it, also if you have a plant that is, is looking sickly and you don't know why, perhaps they can help you diagnose and treat that problem. Uh, joining a garden club is a great way to get to learn more and uh, uh, you can trade plants with other people as well. Uh, or you could befriend gardeners in your neighborhood, uh, whether it's vegetable gardeners or flowers and uh, learn from each other and be generous with each other. And in fact, you can even um, form work parties, which can be fun for everybody in another uh, occasion to uh, collaborate, to celebrate and to learn from each other as well. So um, inviting children to be stewards of nature is, is very important. It gives children uh, that feeling of accomplishment uh, and self-confidence that comes from growing your own plants. And, uh, and perhaps if they're growing vegetables, that will give them a, a taste for uh, fresh food that will uh, uh, just, just demonstrate what real food tastes like and, uh, and, uh, and help encourage them to have a healthy diet. And uh, fostering a love and respect for nature also will ensure that we'll have another generation of, of uh, folks growing up who will be activists and will, uh, who will care about the environment. Um, all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. And so we have responsibility for future generations, uh, not only of humans, but of plants and animals that can't speak for themselves. There is no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are and thank you for doing your part. So again, my email address is info at johnroot.net. Please send me a message if, and ask for my uh, list of resources if you would like. Uh, that would include the, um, the, the uh, plants offered by Kathy Neal, uh, and and uh, the nurseries and all the other uh, resources that I mentioned. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if there are any questions in the chat. Um, I didn't see any questions. I thought we could uh, open it up to questions now if anyone has one, since okay. we're you know, as a small group. Does anyone already have a pollinator garden and, and want to share what you're growing? Oh, Nancy Holt, you have your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Nancy. Nancy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? How about you, Diane? Uh, yes, I have a big problem with bittersweet. And um, it, it's difficult for me to pull out the roots. What I was wondering is if I uh, cut it back and uh, kind of hollowed out the top of the stem and put salt in it and covered it over, if the bittersweet roots would draw in that salt and die. That is a good question. And I don't have the answer to it. Um, perhaps you could call the, uh, the master gardener uh, of course, you can always do uh, a, a 
internet search to answer questions like this, but that, that uh, Master Gardener uh, resource would be another possibility. You know, the uh, Mass uh, Tower Hill uh, Hort line that I mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, my question is, do the yellow jackets serve any purpose whatsoever? Yes, they do. Uh, they, uh, they feed their young, um, uh, you know, uh, I think they prey on flies and, and insect larvae that, would, that might otherwise be pests. So, you know, in that category of beneficials, the predators, parasites, they are predators. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a question. Um, you mentioned organic um, pesticides. Do you have any recommendations or especially something that you could make um, at home that would be useful? Well, there's something, uh, vinegar has been used uh, or it might be vinegar and salt. I forget if there's something in combination with vinegar. Uh, it's not advisable, however, to use that in a typical garden situation because you don't, you probably don't want to make your soil acidic, which vinegar certainly would do. But uh, it can, it can be used for places like in the cracks between flagstones or, uh, you know, in places where you just want to kill the vegetation and you don't care uh, what happens to the soil itself. Um, but as for um, uh, organic herbicides, I, I can't say that I'm an expert on that topic. So again, I would suggest doing a, a internet research for that or, or asking an expert. And, and also it, it, it matters uh, which, which pest you're wanting to target. Well, thank you. I'm looking at um, aphids primarily. We've tried ladybugs and not had any luck. So that was right. my, question, but thank you. Um, this is Irene. I love cone flowers, but unfortunately, every time I plant new ones, the rabbits love them also. Yes, I appreciate that. Yes, and, and groundhogs as well. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what to say other than, you know, unless you can um, protect them in some way, like giving them a fence. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, if I suppose you might be done and I thank you for joining me and uh, uh, happy gardening, everyone. Thank you so much. That was really, really informative. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. You're welcome. That's Nicholas. <laughs> you know, we just met today. Oh, yeah, right. Hi, Nicholas. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.